and welcome to Art Fictions. I'm critic and author Elizabeth Fullerton and my guest this week is the super talented London-based French artist Ingrid Bertonwan, whose drawings, sculptures and photographs home in on the bodily zones many people in our prudish Anglo-Saxon culture might find embarrassing. As a shortcut to thinking about the social construction of gender, she depicts male and female genitalia, those odd fleshy lumps, bumps and puckered holes, areas that sprout ungainly hairs or seep with fluids, in a way that manages to be both humorous and sensitive, erotic and vulnerable. Check out the podcast notes for more information on Ingrid's work, recent shows, reading and I Lack It, I Like It Instagram project. Welcome, Ingrid. Thank you very much for having me on your on your podcast. Oh, absolutely. I'm very, very happy. Thank you. <laughs> Fantastic. So Ingrid has chosen the groundbreaking, ball-busting, cult feminist book King Kong Theory by the French filmmaker and writer Virginie Despont. King Kong Theory was first published in 2006, and this is how the great poet Eileen Miles describes it. A fuck you pushback against a blood-sucking patriarchal culture that keeps murdering and raping women till they get the idea, the survivors, ha, that they should be stupidly grateful to serve men, just lucky to even be allowed to play. Brimming with punk bravado, King Kong theory delves into the stigmatization of issues such as rape, prostitution and porn and lays bare the hypocrisy of this. Despont writes with a fresh, raw, no bullshit style that's incredibly compelling. But what makes the prose especially strong is that she writes from personal experience. You rage with her when you read her horrific account of being gang raped at the age of 17 with her friend by three boys who they had hitched a ride with outside Paris. You understand the empowerment she felt turning tricks in Lyon and Paris earning way more than she ever could in her previous job at a supermarket. A mix of memoir, autobiographical essay and manifesto, the book is a testament to female strength, guts and resilience. The villain in all this is, rightly, the capitalist patriarchy, which exploits both men and women, forcing them, us, into rigidly codified, disempowering roles and behaviours that serve the unending cycle of global capital. Despont's brilliant introduction gives you a good taste of what's in store. I write from the realms of the ugly, for the ugly, the old, the bull dykes, the frigid, the unfucked, the unfuckable, the hysterics, the freaks, all those excluded from the great meat market of female flesh. So Ingrid, tell me why you chose the book. Well, I wanted to choose uh, a woman now. Somebody was speaking the same language than me, so French. I don't know, I think uh, Virginie Despont is such a classic. And I was just like, oh, you know, why not? And I like this kind of autofiction, but which also brings a lot of concepts and ideas and theory in the thinking. And also, like two months ago, my daughter was 16 years old. And this is the first book I gave to her. And I hope she will read it several times in a lifetime. I wanted to give a a feminist point of view. So that's why I like those two connections. It's like passing between generations, you know, because I'm from the same generation than Virginie Despentes. Yeah, valuable life lesson. And when did you first read King Kong Theory? And how did it affect you at the time? I remembered the strength of it, you know. It's quite forceful. You know, when you read it, it's intense. Some passages are like, she goes for it. But I mean, I don't know any woman who cannot be sensitive to everything she says, you know. And she speaks for all women, no matter if they are feminist or not. You know, especially the passage you've just read, it's just like, we are those women. Yeah, she's quite hard on the women, though, who support the patriarchy, isn't she? Rightly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but she faces it. She's not like, oh, yeah, all women are fantastic because our women is just like, well, you are complete as well. And I think that's why King Kong Theory is about, you know, it's just like mm, you have the choice to be free, but you, you decide to always go back to patriarchy or to be the, the psychic of men. She really points the finger to us as well, you know. I thought it was also really interesting when she was talking about how prostitution 
gave her the chance to experiment and explore loads of things that she might not have in a normal relationship. She was able to be much more daring and try out things without inhibitions. When you look at her life, it's a a life well lived, you know? Yeah. Uh, I mean, she's been for a lot. She's been successful. She's a very independent woman. I mean, she's changed sexuality as well, you know? It's just like, wow, that's a a fantastic uh, life, you know? Yeah, no, amazing. I mean, she's right up there. She and Maggie Nelson, you know, the real icons. What do you read as the King Kong theory of the title? I don't know, because she explains it in one of her chapters, because she described this film, you know, where the woman is, uh, is kidnapped, you know, to be offered uh, as, as a gift to, to King Kong. Yeah, it's Peter Jackson's King Kong, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And after she finds herself, but after she decides to go back to heterosexuality, and, and I think for me this is what she underlines, you know, it's just like you had a choice, but you chose that. Yeah, because in the chapter where she talks about it, she speaks of the island where King Kong is as a sort of pre-gendered utopia where there was no binary sex gender system. And my understanding is that that's really what she would like us all to collectively fight to recoup, to get back to as the feminist venture to disregard these artificial distinctions that society imposes. Yeah, that's why I think she sees the island as a polymorphous sexuality paradise, you know. Actually, I don't know if you know this book, it's uh, it's called Her Land and it's by Charlotte Perkins Gilman. No. And it's very interesting. It's, I think it was at the end of the 19th century. And it's an isolated society which is only composed of women. And they all reproduce via... Parthenogenesis, you know, like uh-huh. a, a sexual reproduction. Mm-hmm. And the result is like a kind of an ideal social order which is free of war, conflict, and domination. It's very, very interesting to read. I know I'm sorry, we should stick with Virgin Depont, but <laughs> whenever I, I read uh, Virgin Depont, I always think about her land. So it's also a book I would highly recommend. <laughs> yeah, also Ursula Le Guin does a lot with complicating the gender story, doesn't she? I love her books because she just finds other ways of thinking around social patterns of existence and social groupings and ways of enacting sexuality and gender. But yeah, I'll look out for that. Do you have any passage that you would like to read out of King Kong Theory? There is one which I found quite interesting because it's at the end of the book and she talked directly to men. So she says, men love to talk about women. It spells them from talking about themselves. How is it possible that in 30 years, not a single man has written an original essay on the subject of masculinity? If they're so voluble and so competent when it comes to holding forth about women, why this utter silence about themselves? Because we know that the more they talk, the less they say about what is essential. What about what they are really thinking? Maybe they want us to talk about them. And there's a, it's a bit further down the pages as well. She asked the question, what is the freedom that so terrifies men that they continue to say nothing, to devise nothing, to come up with no new or original discourse or critique about their own condition? When do we get men's liberation? It's up to them, to you, to say your independence. I've always loved these quotes. I think for me, it's like all the minorities, we've all done our homework of how our uh, identity has been constructed, you know, whatever it's women, whatever it's people of color, whatever it's colonization, etc. But men, they've never done this homework. They never ask themselves the questions. Why are we this way? Or why have we, have we become that way? And I think that's what she, she asked them the question. So what are you waiting for? And I guess by all those minority asking questions, in a way they are molding men as well. It's just like, you know, because they push, they push their different strength coming, you know, all this movement like Me Too, you know, or things like that. We are, we are opening up a lot of, uh, of dialogue, you know, we are pointing the fingers at what's going on. Mm-hmm. So I guess there is a lot of uncomfortable uh, dialogue it's actually very 
disempowering for men too to not delve into masculinity and to open up the yeah. dialogue around it. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't understand why there is an, an essay or an article which would grab everybody's attention who said, oh my God, that's the foundation text for, I don't know, it's just like when you see Virginie Despentes. I mean, her book was published in 2006. I don't know when it was translated for English languages, but with the Me Too campaign, it become even more popular, you know. At the beginning, I had the impression that it was just for French, the French readers, but suddenly it's become a global audience. And that came with the, the Me Too movement. So I found that quite interesting this kind of second wave of interest for a book yeah and i've always think that yeah she's a visionary she has she always had like a generation of foresight mm -hmm. because you know in france she made a film in 2000 and it got censored it was too much and it was about prostitution about pornography and uh, same with the book you know it was just like oh my god what's going on here i remember when she did the film it was too ahead of a time, you know, it was just people couldn't take it, especially men, you know, it was just like, oh, suddenly they became very like old fashioned, you know, it was like, oh, let's go back to those old manners, like, you know, it was suddenly the women were taking their thunder away. The film, that's Besmoi, right? Yeah. Which I think translates most closely as Fuck Me. Yeah. 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 She mentions in the book, doesn't she, the scandalous reaction to that because it was a woman writing that book and she was wanting to speak for women rather than have a man speak for women on these topics. And people wanted to analyze her and her personal life and her habits and her look without wanting to look at the content of the actual book and the film. Yeah, exactly. It was everything except the film. It's just like, ask the right question. It's about the film. It's not about the way she looks or she, how she behaves. She was treated very, very harshly. Yeah, I have to say I was quite shocked by the fact that there was so much negativity coming from women that she talks about, you know, that so many women reacted so badly. They felt threatened by her portrayal of independence and freedom you know when she talks about porn and prostitution you know the fact that she decided to do something that society wouldn't approve of and take control of her own I guess, body I guess the women they think like oh shit you know uh, I behave in a certain way to please and suddenly you have this woman showing me a different way and that makes me feel even more shit I guess that's why she said about the King Kong theory. It's just like women are accomplices of all that. And we'd rather go back to this kind of heterosexuality, which is a bit debilitating. Or not debilitating, but it's just, it's not the greatest, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's true. She does show an alternative way of being for women, an alternative mode. And, you know, not to be scared of yeah. difference and of breaking out of... What she says is don't be scared of not conforming. And she's right. I actually hadn't read Virginie Despont before you recommended this, but I knew her name already through reading Paul B. Preciado, yes, um, yeah. who she went out with before he began the process of, and I think during the process yeah, of I think during the to a man. Of I mean, I can imagine the discussions together, you know, like... Well, those two are a powerhouse of thinking on gender and sexuality. I mean, they're amazing. You know, they've yeah. done so much pioneering work between them that have changed lives. When you read Paul B. Preciado or Virginie as well, they're showing us how rigidly we've been taught to define as soon as you meet someone, to define them by their sex or their gender, you know, what is that person? You want to put them in a pigeonhole. And why? Why is that necessary? And I remember when Paul Preciado, I, I read the Testo Junkie, and uh, I like the lived experience mixed with theory. You know, I always find that much more, it anchors you more yes. in the in the reading. And I, I always tend to go to this for this kind of writing. I can get it, you know. Yeah, he argues it really powerfully, as does Virginie. But so I'm wondering where the affinities are for you with King Kong theory and your practice. I'm guessing it's mainly in attitude. 
I think we come from the same uh, anger or frustration about the unfairness of the situation, you know. And I think for me, um, it started with this, there's a grammatical rule in French, and it's when there's a plural with uh, masculine and feminine, the masculine always overcome the feminine. So when you start writing uh, in French at school from the age of six, you are always being said that le masculin l'emporte toujours sur le féminin, which means the masculine always overcomes the feminine. And I think when there is a rule like that, which is ingrained in the language, I just find that appalling, you know. Well, it sends a really strong signal to society, yeah. doesn't it, about who is overriding who? Who is the important one who must be listened to over the other? Which yeah. voice is more important, you know? Yeah, exactly. And it's a chosen man because uh, one of the, the academicians, you know, in France said that uh, men were more, uh, had a more noble, uh, noble character. <laughs> Me, when I think, I try to play on well with the French and English, when, I, when they say, um, oh, noble, I always write noble with a K, like K-N-O-B. Uh, <laughs> like uh, yeah. So yes, that's the unfairness of all that. Have French feminists found a way linguistically to get around that problem? Yes, at the moment there is a development, is it called that inclusive writing? Yeah. To be honest, I'm not too familiar with it because, well, I, I don't live in France, so I know some people use it more and more, I guess, especially women. And there is a fight around that, you know, in the, with the language and um, with academicians and stuff like that. You know, at this subject, I mean, my daughter, she's in the British system. And at the beginning, I really wanted her to go to a French school, you know. Um, but at the same time, that's the only thing which really made me uncomfortable. It's that she was going to learn this genderification of the language, you know, and uh, learning this rule for me, I was just like, that made me really cringe. So I had this little sight of relief when uh, in the end she went in the, in the English system, you know, I'd say at least you won't feel like half a human being because you don't have a penis, you know. Yes, exactly. Going back to the book, I wanted to read out a passage myself. For me, mm -hmm. one of the most powerful passages of King Kong theory was Virginie Despont's discussion of rape and male mm -hmm. attitudes, because she goes on to talk about how both men and women collude in not naming rape. We find other terms, but we don't call it rape because men don't want to be seen as rapists and women don't want to be rape victims. This is her description of what happened to her and her friend. While it's happening, they pretended not to know quite what is going on. With our mini skirts and our day glow hair, one green, one orange, it's obvious we fuck like rabbits. So the rape being committed is not exactly rape, like most rapes, I suspect. I suspect that since that night, none of these three guys thinks of himself as a rapist, because what they did wasn't rape, it was something else. Three guys with a gun beating two girls until we bled, not rape. The proof, if we really didn't want to be raped, we'd rather have died, or we'd have managed to kill them. The viewpoint of the aggressors, which they somehow managed to convince themselves is true, is that if the women to whom this happens make it out alive, it means they must have enjoyed it to some extent. And then she goes on in that essay, in that chapter, talking about how she avoided confronting the experience. And she only found a way forward to think about it after she read the American feminist writer Camille Paglia. And what she has to say about rape was that women need to accept that rape is the risk of living and moving about freely. And this is a second brief passage because I think it's so important in this book. For the first time, someone was validating the ability to get over it instead of meekly lying down amid a treasury of trauma, delegitimizing rape, its impact, its importance. It did not invalidate what had happened, nor did it erase what we had learned that night. So Paglia proposed thinking of rape as a risk inherent to the condition of being a woman, an unprecedented freedom, a minimization. Yes, we had been outside in a space that was not ours. Yes, we had lived rather than died. 
Yes, we'd been wearing mini skirts on our own with no guy in the middle of the night. Yes, we'd been dumb and weak, unable to smash their faces, weak in the way girls are taught to be when they're assaulted. Yes, it had happened to us, but for the first time we recognized what we had done. We had gone out because there was fuck all to do staying at home with mummy and daddy. We had taken the risk, we had paid the price, and instead of feeling ashamed that we were still alive, we could decide to pick ourselves up and get over it as best we could. Paglia made it possible for us to see ourselves as warriors, no longer personally at fault for something we'd been gagging for, but ordinary victims of a crime that women should expect to have to face if they decided to venture outside. Paglia was the first person to extricate rape from the utter nightmare, from being unmentionable, a thing that must never be allowed to happen. She turned it into a political event, something we had to learn to get through. Paglia changed everything. Rape was no longer something to deny, something to be crushed by, but something to live with. No, but yes, it's true because it's like the shame is on the victim, you know, when the shame we should be on the, on the aggressor. But we all live with this fear, you know, we are all fearful when uh, we are very careful now, especially after all these events, you know, the last, the last two years. And uh, Sarah Everard. So I ever had, yeah, there were all those women who were, uh, in the end, they, they got murdered. I don't know if they were murdered because they were just women. You know, if a man, any man had crossed the path of the murderers, nothing would have happened to them. But because they were women, they got killed. You know what I mean? Yeah, totally. Sarah Everard really had such an impact on women because, yeah, she was killed by a policeman. And, you know, she did kind of everything right in the end. She was wearing some kind of non-noticeable clothes. She was speaking to her boyfriend or partner on her way home. It wasn't that late. And I was reading the, in The Guardian, there's something like 80 women killed since that, yeah. I mean, in Britain. But it's true. What Virginie Despont is also saying is rape is something that just happens so often. I know so many people she kind of liberates us accepting that it's a fact of life and we have to take precautions and arm ourselves mentally and I have a daughter as well so you know I want her to go out and to enjoy life I don't want to scare her you know so there is always this thing between fear and freedom for her you know yeah so push and pull uh, in between that and recently, something happened to her because she went to a music festival. She was in the crowd and there's a guy who, who came behind her and he started touching her body in all the wrong places. And that really, really pissed me off. So there's also all this anger towards this kind of behavior. Who are you to think that a woman's body is open to, to that kind of behavior? Like it's acceptable. I was so angry when she told me the story. Yeah, it goes back to what Despont says about how male desire has been constructed as this uncontrollable animal thing that we can't resist, we can't fight because it's just dangerous and brutal and can't be resisted. I have no friends who ever go uh, to a guy and put their hands to, to their balls or their ass. I mean, hello? You know, have you seen recently on the tubes they start having posters about touching? No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It happy. I saw that last week and I was just like, oh, that's new. That. Sadly, I don't think it's noticeable enough. Going back to, for example, to this music festival, I think like there was 70% of women who had been touched inappropriately during gigs or festivals or things like that. So they really have to do more prevention with all of that. You know, any kind of crowded places, there's this uh, sexual harassment. It's a sad time where you have to put posters and warnings do not touch women's body as if it's open to all you know no women need that poster to tell yeah. them not to do the same to men but you know at the point what i like in the introduction you know the introduction you read she also talks to men she's like oh i also write for you guys you know the one who don't conform to the expectation of masculinity i don't know i think i love it here but yes yes read it so uh, I'm also writing for the guys who don't want to be protectors, those who want to be but don't want to, don't know how, those who don't know how to fight, those who cry easily, those who are not ambitious or competitive or well-hung or aggressive. 
those who are timid, shy, vulnerable, those who'd rather look after the house than go out to work, those who are weak, bold, too poor to be appealing, those who long to be fucked, those who don't want to be dependable, those who are scared on their own every night. You know, yeah. so I, I like the way she completely uh, put everybody in this book. Yeah, that makes an apt segue to your practice because it is strongly feminist, but doesn't exclude men and probing ideas around masculinity. So I'd like to take a moment to give listeners a bit more sense of your practice, which actually blossomed out of an engagement with photography. Having earned her master's in photography in 2009 from the London College of Communication, Ingrid has used the medium to think about objectification, reclaim taboos and turn the male gaze on men. She's made portraits of women wearing their own menstrual blood as lipstick and made photographic studies of the balls of Greek classical statues for a project called Marbles. Since she completed her MFA in fine art from Goldsmiths in 2017, her practice has increasingly incorporated sculpture, painting and drawing, always in a feminist vein with a deadpan, uninhibited humour. There have been shower curtain-like installations featuring giant painted ejaculations, all manner of abstract phallic sculptures in varying states of arousal and more often flaccidity, and suggestive arrangements of hair, latex and tights. During lockdown, the drawing side of Ingrid's practice seems to have really come into its own. There's something very tender about the watercolour drawings. They appear deceptively simple, almost cartoon-like, but hit the nail on the head every time. Hey Hey, for example, shows a person with upturned sausage-like breasts that look like they're about to take off and a massive black strap-on from which a figure is about to jump like from a diving board. Coming! depicts a stick figure again with gravity-defying elongated boobs joyfully shooting a fan of fluid into the air. Then other drawings are more abstract, although always sensual and suggestive. So I'm curious, Ingrid, what set you on this path? What is it about genitalia that you find so compelling? (laughs) (laughs) Because I like playing with them. Uh, I don't know, I think it's quite childish in a way, you know, like, mm, mm, uh, willy, boobies. Uh. <laughs> you know, when I, when I hear little children going like, you know, playing with that, I, I just find it so giggly. I mean, I like to, to use the body as a playground, you know, that's how it starts. Yeah, it's quite uh, funny to play with all those areas because they always react, <laughs> you know. Sometimes I've been thinking if I was going to play with all the body parts, you know, and I'm like, maybe the mouth, you know, or it's more like a, a childish uh, thing. Mm-hmm. But you also like wordplay and puns and sexual innuendo, which is almost quite a British sensibility. How does that linguistic for horseplay, not foreplay, go down in France? I don't know, because, yeah, I like to play on words or, or things like that. But um, sometimes I wonder if I had made art in France, uh, if I would have joked that much, because I've been living here for like more than 20 years. And I really like the British sense of humor. And I also like that it connects people so easily. I think that's what is great here is that people, even if they are complete strangers, they can always ex- exchange a little joke. You know, in the street, they are queuing together and there will be a little comment and that will bring a smile to people. And I really, really like that. So I guess I use that as a method of, of connection with mm-hmm. people. I don't know if I can really translate that in French, actually. Mm-hmm. But especially with the lack, for example, uh, if I really translate some of the, the title with the French word, it won't work as well. Yeah. So you completed not one, but two master's degrees here in London. What drew you in the first place to Britain? Well, at first, uh, I came to England because uh, I wanted to improve my English. And at that time, it was under the new labor. And I think they had this kind of marketing plan of like, come to cool Britannia. So it seemed very, very appealing to go there. So I came to improve my English and I stayed, you know. 
And since uh, I was a teenager, I was taking photos. So I decided to put a little portfolio together and to apply to a, a local college next to where I was living. And they gave me a place. So I started there. And maybe within the first two, two or three months of the course, I fell pregnant with my daughter. But for me, you know, going back to study was a new beginning. You know, it was really like finding my way. And so that's why I really link that with my, my daughter. And she's always been either inside me or by my side. And on this little course after I met one of the tutors and he said, oh, you should apply for an MA. Uh, I said, well, but I don't have a BA. I can't say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just try to apply to the LCC. And they gave me a place. And this is where I did register color. I also did a video when I was there, which was called Slave to the Rhythm. And I was playing guitar with my tampon string, <laughs> <laughs> which you cannot find anywhere because I've been censored by Vimeo, by Instagram. Are you serious? But I read that that got shown in Venice. Yes, uh, it got shown in um, an off-site in Venice, yeah. And it nearly got censored as well. They were in trouble with the police there, yeah. Oh, for God's sake. I'm trying to picture it. Was it playing the tampon string when the tampon's in? Yes, yes, yes. Right. Yeah. Okay. You know, yes. it was a retake of Judy Chicago, uh, The Red Flag, you know? Right. She's removing a tampon, except me, the tampon was inside and you can see the little green cord and uh, I'm playing on the uh, Slave is the Rhythm by Grace Jones. I love that. Yeah, it, it was funny. Yeah. How has being in London opened up avenues for you are there avenues that you think it's opened up which might not have been available in France well I guess when you come from a different culture you are also the the bit of the outsider or you're the exotic one you know the one with the French accent blah 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 so it makes you it makes you think you know and uh, or people put you in some kind of stereotype oh but the French are like this are like that Um, so you think about your your identity as well the only difficulties is when you, you study and you're a mother, you know, because you don't have much time. You can't really network as you would like to. When my daughter was small, I was doing everything in the house. So I couldn't really leave things like if I would leave them in a, in a studio. So I always had to tidy up after. And, uh, and sometimes it was just full of dicks and balls. And uh, it was just like not very comfortable <laughs> for a young child. I think... I miss a lot on network possibilities. Even I realized that actually very recently because I finished at Goldsmiths in 2017 and I didn't have a studio there. So uh, I was always going just for my tutorials or for a group read or things like that. But after I found myself sharing a studio with some other students from Goldsmiths actually, and I realized all the things I had missed, you know, yeah. like Jake seeing how other people were working, how they were applying for things. And I realized I had missed such, I had a real lack of this way of being an artist, you know, I was just like, merde, you know. But now I try to catch up. Yeah. <laughs> that's a lot of, a lot of women, so. Yeah, definitely trying to juggle millions yeah. of balls, so to speak. Can we talk about your Goldsmiths degree show, which was called Looking at Lack of Perspective, as I feel it ties in with some of Virginie Despont's ideas also in King Kong Theory. So alongside several tactile sausage-shaped sculptures, you placed a huge cutout photograph of you against the backdrop of London's skyline. And it looks like you're scrutinizing a naked man's limp penis with all the detachment of a factory quality inspector, as if you're inspecting some random product. (laughs) So what inspired the show? How did it start? I mean, recently I found some of the photos I had taken because I I started with uh, playing with dildos, you know, so I was putting dildos on my head, on my shoulders. And uh, I think it just started with playing, actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I had some dildos at the studio. Uh, oh, I'm going to put one on my shoulder. Like if I had the little voice, you know, the little voice that whisper in your ear. <laughs> and after one on top of my head, and I'm just like, oh, actually, if I was doing that with uh, a real one, you know, and uh, and make a series out of it. And I found a model, and uh, and it was really good, very professional, no erection, you know. So it was always keeping it soft and flaccid for me. <laughs> And after I was just like, okay, that's a good series, but what can I do to contextualize it? You know, because 
just a photograph like that wouldn't have worked. And after when I was given the space at Goldsmiths, which was on the fifth floor, you know, and you have an amazing view all over London. And I know I wanted to obstruct the view to people because people otherwise they, they, they stuck their nose on the, on the windows and just look at the view instead of looking at the work. So I'm like, okay, how can I obstruct that? And in fact, it was a, a good way of thinking and a good method to include uh, the view and also the, the context of the piece because the, the cut-out photograph in between my nose and the tip of the penis, you have the, the towers of the city of London. All those very phallic towers being in opposition with a flaccid penis, which cannot really stand by itself. So it's, it rests on my finger. And uh, I really like that fan uh, expression on the face. So, uh, I mean, it's my profile, but you see I'm like, I'm not having it. And also, usually when you see uh, the face of a woman next to a penis, usually it's very associated with pornography and like the money shot, you know, like you're going to have a facial. I think they call that a facial. But here, just like I was in charge, you know, and I'm like, what's so interesting or what's not that interesting? And, uh, and so that's why uh, even the title uh, encompass all that, you know, the, the lack of perspective from the men's point of view and having the perspective of looking at the representation of capitalism, you know, like the city and the public towers. I love how it does subvert porn because you're not expressing any joy or excitement or thrill about the prospect of doing something with the penis. There's just none of that whatsoever oh, there's no emotion it's just like no. yeah it's indifference what about your drawing what is its role in your practice you know with art when you're a child you get notice if you can draw you know oh he can draw he's an artist or he will be a creative me i was always very bad at drawing or you i couldn't draw a cat i was just like so i said oh i can't draw for years and years and years and after I was on a course and somebody said yeah but you can draw you, you know you always doodle something and I was just like oh somebody planted the seed and I started drawing and drawing it was a very organic process you know and I started with some pencils you know always the same kind of very flashy colors and after I started with watercolor one day I decided to try and uh, and from then it's uh, it's been building up. I do a lot of abstract drawing and sometimes you have the, the occasional uh, character. So when it's a woman, I call the uh, Lali because it's all the initials for Lucky like Like It. So okay. she's a Lali and I have a few Lalis uh, going on. They always look like very elongated legs. It's just, they look quite childish to them. You know, I think it's the kind of drawings a child could do. And sometimes, yeah, they express some kind of frustration or some kind of anger or sometimes it's completely mistaken. Usually I draw from home. I'm on my kitchen table. It's quiet. It's like meditation for me. It's just my world. Uh, and I really cherish those moments. And so it's quite spontaneous. Unless I do some very big ones, because recently I've started doing some kind of drawing slash painting, which are like 150 by 2.3 three meters. So there I need a bit more planning, of course. When it's like that, yeah, I'm doing a little uh, sketch, but otherwise no. It's interesting, the bodies that your figures have, their tits are always really skinny, long sausages, almost, that it seem to be about to fly. And they're quite androgynous. You know, they're not massively curvaceous. I just wondered if you have a particular reason for depicting your figures in the way you do. For women, I put the big tits. <clears throat> they look a bit like uh, elephant tusk, you know, there's a bit yeah. of... And some people say, oh, they look like wings. <laughs> <That's them. laughs> but for the women, I always put a red dot yes. inside the groin because for me, it's like the clitoris, so I, I put that. Right. And for men, I will always put like an elongated penis and some dangling balls. Yeah. You know, so we, they look a bit bouncy, but uh, they're a bit tired. <laughs> I don't know, but sometimes they look a bit like children bodies, you know, we always have a, a bit of a very round body, you know, the stomach yeah. and, uh, and their two little legs. Maybe that's what makes them so tender feeling. Yes, I think the women, they're a bit more aggressive. I think men, they, they always kind of look a bit lost, like, oof, you know, a bit more vulnerable. Yeah. When we, most of the time, I uh, I put them with their hands on their hips, you know, and it's just like, ha-ha. 
when men, it's a bit like, ooh, a bit startled about uh, what's going on. And that's why I like the hey, hey drawing, because it's just a woman being strapped, you know, and there's a guy on top of the pins, and it's just like, oh, shall I take the plunge? You know, I think it's also to do with the penetration of the heterosexual male body, because it's such a taboo. And uh, you can see he's scared, 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 scared. And, uh, and the woman, she's like, hey, 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 hey. <laughs> You'll see how it feels. You'll feel how it feels. That makes me think of the King Kong theory where Virginie Despont says men all actually just really want to be fucking other men. Yes. Doesn't that's, she? Yeah. That's powerful. That is just like, in fact, you want to fuck like a gay man, you know? And I'm like, wow, well, that's a strategy. You know, she completely reversed the whole situation. And I really like that. And it's quite efficient. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She definitely likes to turn things on their head so that gives you another perspective apart from the conventional one. Another project that really got going in lockdown was your Instagram project, I Lack It, I Like It, where you invited women in the arts to discuss their likes and lacks. Can you say a little bit about that? The slogan, uh, I don't know when he, when it's, I think it was during my MA at Goldsmiths and uh, I like alliterations. I thought it was, in French, I would say, oh, ça claque, you know, it, like, like, yeah. like, you know. And, and I was doing some little stickers that I used to give to women or wherever I was going abroad, I was always taking a photograph. And during the lockdown, I was just like, oh, I could do more with that, but I couldn't find a, a way. And I think one day I saw somebody who was doing some very short interviews on Instagram and I said, oh, maybe I could just find four or five questions questions and interview women so I, that's why I started it and I just started with maybe two or three interviews Kuma Kedashi I said yes there was Katie Judah there was Helen Knowles Marcia Michael etc after I built up from that I love doing it all of them are good and some of them are very very powerful it depends sometimes how much people give as well you know so that's how it started and uh, I want to do a website now. I would like to compile all these interviews in one document because I think on the website it could be translated by some motor research. I think it would touch more people and see from uh, there what could happen. One thing you didn't mention is that it started with Freud. Yeah, because it's all about the women suffering from uh, the penis envy, you know, and I'm like, really? I think it's completely uh, outdated. I mean, I don't miss what I don't have. I don't know, for me, when sometimes when I look at a, a male's body, I said, it, it looks a bit faulty. You know what I mean? It's, it's <laughs> extra bit. You know, imagine you're in a um, quality check in a factory, and if you see something extra, then it's taken off, and it's not on the, it's not going to be sold. And here, I always this kind of extra bit. Uh, I'm like, that's, again, a point of view which can be completely taken the other way around. It's just like, I like it, I like it. That's just the way it is. Yeah, that makes me think that I was spot on when I was talking about you as a factory inspector. That theory of Freud, the yeah. penis envy, feels really very sexist, very misguided, actually. I think to assume that all women are defined by that lack oh, is yeah. something so absurd that it's a brilliant premise for a project like yours. Yeah, and some women have some beautiful answers uh, with uh, with that because I always ask them to interpret the slogan. They come up with lots of possibilities, you know, not solutions, but possibilities, you know. We didn't talk about how your practice has evolved and I wondered what challenges lie ahead. When I was doing my MA in photography, I realized that I was just a user of photography. I'd never considered myself as a photographer. I also thought that uh, the medium was very restrictive, you know. Most of the time it was square, rectangular, flat on the wall. And I was just like, oh, I wanted to take the space. But I started playing around with sculptures and uh, I'm trying to find my way. I would say I would like to go bigger. I always work with a human size. I like that, you know, but maybe some bigger drawings or bigger paintings. To go back, you know, to what I said about my daughter, you know, who had been, who had been uh, sexually harassed. I remember that day I was doing some drawings on the table and I started uh, drawing clothes, you know, like animal clothes. So I guess for me, it was a, a very visceral animal um, desire to protect her, but also a very uh, aggressive way. You know, whenever something bad happened to her, my daughter, I always have this image in my head of, slashing somebody's with some some clothes that I don't have and I would like to do uh, some pieces about that 
Also, can you use humor when you're angry? You know, is humor compatible with anger in, a, in an artwork? You know, and I, I try to find a way. Whenever I think about that, I always think of going into demonstration when people prepare their own uh, board, you know, and there's a lot of wit with all that. And I'm like, can I be witty with that? So I'll see where it goes. This year, you've had a pretty productive year, though, haven't you? You've been shortlisted for the Mark Tanner Sculpture Award and for the Ingram Prize. You were in the Drawing Biennial, and I've been lucky enough to be a recipient of your handheld exhibition that you devised with Holly Stevenson as an itinerant exhibition. I had met Holly a few years ago and said, oh, shall we do something together? We started meeting on a regular basis on, on Zoom and, uh, and after the, the idea started coming to, together. I mean, for me, it's more about the, the taboo of touching art linked to the taboo of, uh, of touch during the COVID pandemic. It was a way to play with that. And we came with the concept of the box, having uh, five artists or more, uh, the sizes not bigger than 10 by 10 centimeters and after it it became very very organic and I'm finding people to accept to have the box and for them to play being able to I don't know to curate their own exhibition in their house or to play with the work as toys like you did actually <laughs> it's really a privilege to be able to hold art and the art that you put together both of you in that exhibition is so tactile the materials even the smells and the different textures it's just fantastic to sit there and spend time with it and turn it over in your hand and play and feel you know it's something that you almost never get a chance to do us as artists we are used you know sometimes we touch we, we go for it and but for other people it's this kind of sacred thing when I was doing the little bag you know uh, I was laughing because it's like the sack yeah. you know you can see there is the um, the knob and the, I put the red thing because it's like a little, little clitoris and you can put the, the drawings inside and I like the fabric because I call it thick skin fabric because I think it's a bit like a it dick. does yeah you know what I mean yeah. it's not as uh, thin as uh, thick skin but it's kind of <laughs> <laughs> a bit veiny you know <laughs> on that note <laughs> I think that we've probably reached the end of our discussion. So it really just remains for me to say thank you so much, Ingrid, for being a guest on Art Fictions. It's been really fun to have you. No, oh, thank you for having me. And it's been very nice to talk to you about Virginie Despentes. And I really recommend everybody to read this book. I think it's having a revival. Like What I like as well is that anyone can read it. You know, it's not academic. There's theory, but which is accessible to everybody. Yeah, you know, after you mentioned about your daughter, it made me think that actually my son, who's 15, should also read that. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, more important almost for boys to read that. No, it's up to men, you know. We men, we've done our homework. We know what's going on, but now it's up to them. Thank you, listeners. And also thanks to Ingrid berton Wan and to the founder of the Art Fictions podcast, artist and writer Gillian Knight. Art Fictions Culture Exchange is part of the UK-Australia season, which is a partnership between the British Council and the Australian Government's Department of Foreign Affairs. Guests for the series are artistic practitioners whose work is underpinned by geographical shifts, upheavals and reassessments of their cultural identity. The music for this self-produced abridged podcast was written and performed by Griffin Knight, while award-winning animator Joanna Quinn of Beryl Productions created the Art Fictions logo. If you'd like to support the series, please subscribe and rate, and you're welcome to get in touch with us directly via the Art Fictions underscore podcast Instagram or my or Gillian's websites, gillianknight.com and elizabethfullerton.co.uk. Happy reading and art viewing. Till next time.